Okay, it's time to continue. We have our very last speaker now. Um, I have the honor of introducing Professor Philip Jenkins. He's a distinguished professor of history at Baylor University. He's also the author of 24 books. You can see some of them um, out in the hall. And the best known, uh, to me at any rate, is Mystics and Messiah, which has a picture of the Waco burning on the front end and the story of Koresh. Um, and his best known is probably the, ne the next Christendom. So I would like to introduce Pro Philip Jenkins. Thanks very much to uh, Susan for that uh, introduction. I'm, I'm very unlucky uh, today because I'm um, finishing off after um, a lot of uh, very good papers which have uh, ranged far and wide over the, uh, the Waco uh, crisis and the disaster. And you may be thinking, uh, what else is there to be said? And at this precise moment, that's just what I'm thinking. So uh, bear with me. Um, I'd like to begin by telling a uh, story. Back in 1995, I was writing uh, the first edition of a history of the United States, kind of a one-volume history. And I ended with the story of Waco and Oklahoma City as bringing together so many of the themes that I dealt with in terms of uh, religious experimentation, the idea of the would-be Messiah going off into the wilderness, the clash between religion and government. And I thought that whole story, and not to mention the stream of violence. And I thought uh, ending with that story was good, and I thought that was a, a nice element. One at least of the reviewers thought this was a terrible idea on the basis that they couldn't see what something that was so obviously loopy and a matter for the far lunatic fringe had to do with sober, serious American history. And what I'd like to do today is, I'm, I'm following very precisely uh, on from the last presentation, uh, about the role of Waco in popular culture and in politics, and I would entirely agree it is an extremely important role. Um, in fact, I would underline the uh, angle that uh, what you see in Waco is one of the early battles of something that's become very well known to us, the culture war. The culture war is declared um, about this time. Um, Waco happened at a particular time. It would not have had the impact it did had it not coincided exactly with a series of key debates in American life, debates that are with, with us right now. Uh, we've talked about guns, but also ideas of uh, the role of government, overreach of government, uh, religious freedom, and one that we're going to keep coming back to, uh, gender and the whole idea of uh, masculinity, gender roles. I'll explain that in a moment. I also do want to come back to something that uh, Stuart Wright was uh, talking about, which is this notion of uh, terrorism. Terrorism in the last 20 years has been obviously one of the key issues in American life and American politics. Waco directly and indirectly shapes the modern American agenda of terrorism. Waco was not a terrorist incident, but it leads to an upsurge of right-wing political activism. That upsurge of political activism and extremism leads to a distortion, a deformation of American terrorist policy. And however odd this may seem, there really is a road that runs from Waco through 9-11. We'll we will talk about that. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, popular culture. There are some incidents in American history that are probably better known from popular culture treatments than from any kind of sober history book. If you think of Watergate, uh, you're quite likely to think of it through the film of All the President's Men. There really is nothing directly equivalent to that for Waco. There actually are a number of novels but if I mention them, you'll realize immediately how unfamous they are. 
the horror author uh, Dean Kuntz uh, wrote a, a Waco novel that was called Dark Rivers of the Heart. Uh, John Updike uh, wrote one called uh, uh, Beauty of the, um, sorry, In the Beauty of the Lilies. And they really haven't had that much uh, impact. However, so much of the debate about Waco happens through news programs, documentaries, popular books. If you were around at the time in uh, 1993, you may remember the first coverage in mainstream uh, news media, which was absolutely uncritical. It could have been written by the, uh, the Justice Department. Uh, Time Magazine, for example, published a couple of uh, famous, some ways it would say notorious uh, covers about the absolute evils of uh, David Koresh, who was an evil cult leader. He was an evil messiah. And this gets me to an issue which perhaps we lose when we try and understand the impact of Waco. Things never happen on their own. Things are understood and contextualized in terms of what's happening at the same time, what was happening at the same time as Waco. Very interesting. February 28th, we've heard that date many times today. What happened on February 26th? There was a large car bomb that tried to bring down the World Trade Center. Uh, that was very shortly afterwards uh, traced to um, an, uh, the, the famous blind Egyptian sheikh, Omar uh, Abdurrahman, and there's no doubt that that was an early venture of the group formed in 1990 that we know today as Al-Qaeda. Something else happened very shortly afterwards, on March the 11th, which was the assassination of a doctor who carried out abortions in Pensacola, Florida, by um, a religious extremist called uh, D uh, David Griffin. We understand problems in terms of their context. We map them together, and so for the media, which began by reflecting this very liberal, politically liberal approach, this pro-government approach, what was David Koresh? Why? He must be a third in that unholy trinity, with Sheikh Omar, the Islamic fanatic, and with, uh, with uh, Griffin. And there are cartoons. Um, showing, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the three of them um, marching arm in arm. And we look back at that and we think that's a very bizarre idea, but in the context uh, of the time, um, Waco is originally understood as this idea of what happens when, as time puts it, when believers embrace the dark side of faith. And if you want to see perhaps the, the most I suppose, hysterical immediate reaction to Waco in the popular media. Again, it was Time magazine. And uh, shortly after the fire, Time presented a cover headline, Tragedy in Waco, showing the burning compound superimposed on which is a, a, a hysterically laughing David Koresh with the biblical caption, his name was death and hell followed with him. Don't let anyone ever tell you that secular liberals don't have apocalyptic ideas, they do. People Weekly ran inside the Waco cult, which was about uh, an evil messiah, um, a, a pedophile, and uh, cartoons depicted Koresh, uh, Asayed Sheikh Omar, and of course, arriving in the afterlife and meeting Jim Jones, who uh, presents him with Kool-Aid. The idea is religious extremism, uh, fanaticism. So this cult theme became inescapable. And that, by the way, dominates early TV movies, TV treatments. Uh, if, if you've ever seen the NBC television movie, uh, In the Line of Duty, Ambush at Waco. Uh, and if you've ever seen that, I think se several of the actors who are in that film have subsequently repudiated it because it is such an outrageous uh, propaganda uh, piece. Once again, let's think about this in terms of context. We're in the early 1990s. Think of what America's religious politics had been in the previous few years. In the 1980s, if you were a liberal, there was the terrifying spectacle of the moral majority, of uh, uh, Jerry Falwell, of Pat Robertson, 
and the idea of the mass invasion of American politics by uh, right-wing religious um, extremism. That had changed with the scandals of 1987, all the televangelist scandals, PTL and so on, and that allowed the media to go on the offensive against what they saw as religious extremists. So as far as uh, liberals was, were concerned, as far as large sections of the media were con uh, concerned, what Waco was about was what happens when you have a religious right-wing extremist Please don't tell me David Koresh wasn't a right-wing extremist, I know, um, who carries religion into the realm of fanaticism, of abuse, and of violence. This is what happens when you tolerate, and in a sense, the media when they talk about Koresh, aren't talking about Koresh. They're talking about Falwell and Robertson and all the people they hated in the 1980s. He almost becomes a stalking horse for those, uh, for those others. Now, of course, um, another view was very possible, which was that we were not dealing at Waco with a cult, but rather a persecuted church. And during the 1990s, and this is a fascinating story, this more conservative view grows rapidly in significance so that by 2000, well over 60% of people surveyed believe that the FBI started the fires. They reject the, uh, the official narrative. Um, why does that happen? Again, let's look at what happens in a particular period from about 1990 to 94. And this, this may sound strange. Uh, if you study history, normally you're studying the history of centuries gone by. There may even be people in this room who remember the years 1990 through 1994. And if you remember it, how can it be history? It is such an important period, but a period that does require a little bit of uh, explanation. 1992 was a critical election. It was won basically on economic divisions, but underlying it were strong currents of culture and religion. At the Republican convention that year, uh, Pat Buchanan had galvanized conservatives with a speech that warned that, well, there is a religious war going on in our country for the soul of America. It is a cultural war, as critical to the kind of nation we will one day be as was the Cold War itself. And the phrase culture war, which by the way originated in 1991, um, becomes code for issues about uh, gender roles, homosexuality, abortion. And to quote Buchanan again, the agenda Clinton and Clinton would impose on America, abortion on demand, a litmus taste for this, uh, test for the Supreme Court, homosexual rights, discrimination against religious schools, women in combat. Well, that's change, all right. But it's not the kind of change America wants. It's not the kind of change America needs. It's not the kind of change we can tolerate in a nation that we still call God's country. Think of it this way. Through the 1970s and 1980s, the core of American political debate is often about foreign policy, it's about the continuing Cold War, its reactions to communism. That war ends in the early 1990s. Where does the substance of politics go after that? Between 1990 and 1994, we see a full-scale gender war in this country, and if that seems an extreme phrase, let me just run through some of the things that happen in those years. And when I mention them, I think you'll say, oh yeah, I, I remember that, but never thought of it with the other stuff. Let, what, what do we have? The Clarence Thomas Supreme Court hearings, which are mainly about sexual harassment. The tailhook scandal in the Navy, which was the harassment, the uh, molestation of uh, women uh, aviators. It's when the clergy abuse scandal arises. This idea, go back to what I said about the Navy, of a traditional, powerful male institution, a closed institution whose members uh, grossly misbehave in, um, in sexual terms. Child abuse becomes central to political, cultural debate. These are the years when the whole idea of satanic Cult abuse is at its height. Again, there are secret societies out there. There are vast dangers to, uh, to our children. Have you ever heard the word stalking? 
It reaches its present meaning in 1989. Have you ever heard the word predators in the sense of uh, predator law, sex predator laws, 1990? Uh, it's also in these years when if you turn on one of the main TV news programs, if you turn on uh, 60 Minutes 2020, you will see a story which is basically about the male danger to women and children. You will see stories uh, praising women vigilantes. One of the great heroines of this age is a woman called uh, Ellie Nessler who murdered a man who had supposedly molested uh, her child. And I, I can go on uh, at this at uh, great length, but of course one of the great films of this era is Thelma and Louise. So the, the idea is um, gender has become a major issue. That is a great organizing force for liberals. But it also tends to put gender roles and sexuality right at the center of political debate for conservatives. And that is going to be so important when we look at the uh, response to Waco. And who are the people who are mainly going to be blamed for Waco? The, the women who are seen as the evil force of the Clinton administration, Janet Reno, of course, uh, and Hillary Clinton. So we are, are laying the foundation for a major conservative reaction. And again, I come back to a point Stuart Wright made, which is that Waco is going to be important, not, some, not only in its own right, but for what it is going to uh, to symbolize for the baggage that it brings with it. Bill Clinton won in 1992. He became president. It's very easy to forget how razor thin was that victory. He won the lowest proportion of the popular vote for any Democrat for many years before. He actually won fewer votes in 1992 than Walter Mondale had in 1984. And Mondale was massacred by Ronald Reagan. Clinton won because Ross Perot took 19% of the popular vote. The point I'm making is that Clinton was president, but he was extremely vulnerable, and he was vulnerable on so many of these gender issues, so many of these, what shall I say, culture war issues. Um, and over the next uh, couple of years, uh, that, that becomes apparent. Now, in fact, what, one of the decisions that he, uh, he does make has absolutely got nothing to do with gender, which is he lets it be known that he wants to consolidate some government agencies. And one of the agencies that's going to be consolidated very fast is ATF, which is one reason why, of course, ATF has to put on a major show somewhere where they actually will be seen going through windows to stop them being wound up and merged into the uh, FBI. Uh, please remember, this is not meant to trivialize it, Waco is meant to be theater. It's meant to be seen. It's meant to save ATF's bacon. What actually happens over the next uh, couple of years is that the conservative role in American politics grows very dramatically. 1994 is one of the key turning points in late 20th century political history. It's a massive congressional victory, not just for Republicans, but for very conservative Republicans. It's sometimes been described as Ronald Reagan's third election victory, although clearly he wasn't directly um, involved uh, with it. Um, uh, it's in 1994 that Democrats um, lost the House for the first time since 1954. It, it, it's a historic change. There is mass political dissent, revolt against the, um, against the administration. And that group is also developing new forms of propaganda, uh, disseminating political views, and Waco is going to be so important to, uh, to those views. Um, for example, uh, talk radio becomes a crucial means of disseminating propaganda um, at this time. If you, if you were listening to talk radio at that point, oh, they went on at great length about Waco for year after year. The other thing which becomes very useful 
at that point is um, video. Um, privately made videos are one of the prime means of destabilizing the official narrative um, about Waco. Uh, you have uh, Linda Thompson's uh, Waco, the big lie. Uh, Richard Mosley, uh, Day 51, and what is probably, well, in my view, far and away, the, uh, the, the best of the bunch, uh, Waco Rules of Engagement. Uh, these circulate um, very widely. When the web is just getting going at this point. Here, here's a trivia fact for you. When Bill Clinton came to power, uh, took office in 1993, do you know how many websites there were in the world? 50. That's not 50 million, 50. You could watch them all and then find something else to do with the rest of the evening. Building on this conservative sentiment, you also get a range of right-wing activism, right-wing org uh, organization, which becomes much more militant. We've talked about the National uh, Rifle Association. Famously, in 1995, Wayne Lapierre talks about the danger from jackbooted government thugs. Um, we're talking about a very strong uh, kind of rhetoric. And Waco also merges with other causes that are going to uh, be disseminated widely, talk radio, video. Uh, it's July 1993 that uh, Clinton aide Vincent Foster dies mysteriously. And uh, Foster stories and Waco stories are spread together. You also get a range of quite extreme movements, and this is going to be very important. Um, we get an upsurge of the militias. Famous story, and actually nothing that unusual in American history. Here, here's a rule for you. If you have a long-running conservative Republican administration that is replaced by a liberal Democratic administration, then it's very, very likely that within a couple of years you will get militias. It's what happens in the mid-30s. It's what happens in the mid-60s with groups like the, mid, uh, the Minutemen. Um, it's uh, what happens in 1976. And no surprise that you get it in 1994. Um, but very important. The growth of the militias on this occasion is very important, uh, very sizable and remarkably large. They are running support that is in the several hundred thousand. And that militia force is the core of a much larger movement. It's usually known generically as the Patriot Movement, which includes, for instance, the Common Law Court Movement, groups that believe that there is no legitimate authority um, above the level of the county. There's a very strong uh, anti-government um, feeling. And when foreigners look at the growth of the militias, they're very puzzled. And they say, what is it about America that people can get away with organizing well-armed groups in the thousands, in the tens of thousands, and the government not respond? The largest single reason that they do this in 1994-95 is that the federal government, federal law enforcement, is so completely spooked by what had happened at Waco. Although they try very hard to put a bold face on it and they justify it, they are desperately anxious to prevent anything like that happening again. And one immediate consequence of that is that in the mid-90s, federal law enforcement fails to intervene in several situations where logic demanded that they should have done. There were some whatever you want to call them, compounds, fortresses of uh, militia groups, of patriot groups um, that were truly dangerous and which probably, I don't know about should have been stormed, but were, uh, should have been wound up forcibly if necessary because they actually were centers of sedition, conspiracy, and armed violence. The government was terrified to do that. And if you want to see that dynamic, if you think I'm speaking very generically, Look what happens in 1996 with the, uh, the Free Men movement in Montana. The Free Men were a radical right sect 
they announced they were fortifying themselves in this compound. There, there was a standoff with the government. And if you look at how the government responds, it is the anti-Waco. They're determined not to go in at any cost. And they even, uh, the, the FBI even lines up a bunch of patriot leaders, far-right leaders, to send in as intermediaries, most of whom come out saying, those guys in there are really dangerous. That's one of these sort of strange um, moments. But I would suggest that the reason why um, the militias grow, yes, they, there's a very successful propaganda and so on, but they're allowed to grow, which they would not have been, I think, in other um, circumstances. The ideological foundations of this new patriot movement uh, vary, enor vary enormously. You have some people who are outright you know, neo-Nazis, they're extremists, they're veterans of uh, old far-right movements of the 1930s and very, uh, 40s, uh, very uh, uh, anti-Semitic, they're uh, you know, potentially very, uh, very violent. Vast majority, of course, uh, are not. They're more moderate conservatives who are worried about uh, g gun rights, uh, gun raids, uh, fear that the assault on gun uh, rights is a prelude to a leftist uh, takeover. Um, once again, if you ever want to see uh, these views and understand these views, again, look at the works of Linda Thompson. Uh, look at something like America Under Siege, and you'll see how Waco morphs into this wider patriot ideology, which brings in uh, black helicopters and uh, secret United Nations uh, uh, plots uh, and so on. Waco is a key organizing force. There are two great incidents that they always refer to. One's Ruby Ridge, and one is Waco. Both are equally blatant, but Ruby Ridge does not have the instant name recognition for ordinary people that Waco does. If you are a you know, committed conservative person, you know Ruby Ridge. You know about Randy Weaver. Generally, ordinary, middle-of-the-road people don't. Waco, however, everyone knows Waco, and everyone's prepared to be um, convinced about it. So for, um, for several years, for a couple of critical years, the far-right movements really do succeed uh, remarkably. And by the time you get to 1994-5, you've actually got a quite an interesting situation where not only do you have these movements on the ground, but they have very close allies in Congress and in uh, state legislatures. So, you know, they're, they're politically uh, quite powerful. By the time you get to 1995, it seems as if everything is going the right way. You get the Waco hearings, finally. You get uh, hearings on, uh, uh, on Ruby Ridge. Uh, you actually get major television re-examinations of the Waco affair, though they generally come down on the side of the uh, government. And things are looking very bad indeed for Bill Clinton the following year. What happens? Well, crucially, in April 1995, Oklahoma City happens. Uh, Stuart was mentioning a couple of uh, factors motivating this. Uh, April 19th, 1995, apart from anything else, was the day that uh, one of the leaders of the Covenant Arm, Sword and Arm of the Lord, was to be executed. And uh, the suggestion is, however Tim McVeigh thought about Waco, he also wanted to give Richard Wayne Snell a send-off. And so whether, in fact, Oklahoma City was directly connected with Waco, we, we, can, we can argue. Um, whatever its origins, Oklahoma City transformed the American political landscape it inflicted massive damage on the conservative cause, never mind the far-right cause, and it forced moderates to abandon the patriot movement. It also gave Bill Clinton a whole new status as a national leader, as a moderate leader. Oh, and incidentally, a point I'm, I always try and make, as a leader who always freely invoked religious Christian an evangelical rhetoric far, far more than George W. Bush ever did, but nobody seemed to mind. Um, and it made him a, if you like, a national uh, religious leader. 
Together with the ghosts of Waco that it evoked, Oklahoma City fundamentally reshaped political discourse about terrorism. Ultimately, this may have been Waco's most lasting and most pernicious inheritance. Let me say something about terrorism. It is not immediately obvious what is the greatest terrorist danger facing this country or any country. It is a very politicized issue. Very broadly, very broadly, conservatives tend to look at terrorism as something that happens from outside. It is associated with the Middle East, with the Soviets, as were during the Cold War, and it is a problem to be resolved by a firm, strong-handed foreign policy and military defense. If you are on the left, you are mainly concerned with domestic terrorism and terrorism that comes from the right. What terrorism is, is something that allows you to label, condemn, stigmatize, and fight your enemies. It is a way of saying, terrorism is very bad. You support terrorism, therefore you represent an ultimate evil. Through the 80s, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, terrorism is identified as being Soviet, communist, in alliance with the Middle East. It's in 1983 that the US government is uh, furiously debating whether to put anti-aircraft batteries on, uh, uh, on the White House. Um, and that runs all the way through the early 90s. It's in the early 90s, however, that we get this shift to concern about the, the right, the militias, and the domestic far right and, uh, and neo-Nazis. You know, th this is kind of a hard thing to try and convey because today we're so used to this idea that terrorism equals Middle East. Terrorism equals Muslim danger, Qaeda danger. Between 1995 and 2001, if you suggested that, if you suggested that uh, the greatest danger was a Muslim Middle Eastern uh, danger, if you suggested that those were serious enemies, then you were clearly stupid, racist, and ill-informed. What everyone knew through those years was that the great danger was people like Timothy McVeigh, and David Koresh. Waco reshaped ideas about terrorism and brought it home, emphasized that domestic right-wing context. And you may say, so what? If terrorism comes from overseas, then you fight it overseas. You have a firm policy against Iran. You invade Iraq. You invade Afghanistan. You, you stand up uh, strong um, uh, against different countries. But if terrorism is the domestic far right, how do you fight it? By a series of measures that are basically liberal, social, and political measures, which are music to the ears of the Clinton administration. Passing laws against hate crime trying to control and investigate the anti-abortion movement, try and suppress hate speech on racial matters or gender identity uh, matters. And between 1995 and 2001, when people write about terrorism in this country, and I don't just mean expert tracts, I mean popular media, what they're talking about is basically um, Oklahoma City. Uh, typical titles from this era, if you went into a bookstore and wanted to see the terrorism section, what would you see? Uh, America's militia threat, terrorists among us, the birth of paramilitary terrorism in the heartland, harvest of rage why Oklahoma City is only the beginning, and in my paper I've got a list of like you know 20, uh, 20 similar uh, books. But they all suggest that the real danger in this country as an outgrowth of this right-wing upsurge is, um, is domestic. And that is also strongly reflected in, um, in popular culture. 
I don't know how many of you uh, remember this, but if you turned on a TV series in the late 1990s and you were watching something that was about uh, police, uh, detectives, whatever, then sooner or later you'd have an enemy who was a racist, Nazi, militia, I, I, I'm sorry, I know this is mixed company, but I must use the word Christian enemy. It's a religious threat. It's seen as religious fanaticism. One of my personal favorite uh, was the X-Files, if you happen to remember that. They did a very explicit Waco episode called The Field Where I Died, um, which depicts a cult called the Temple of the Seven Stars, uh, run by a fanatical homicidal cult leader called Vernon, uh, Vernon Ephesian. Uh, and it, it, it basically is the FBI view of, um, of Waco. If you, uh, you have films like uh, uh, American History X, you have all these films about uh, uh, skinheads, Nazis, um, and so on. And you have what, uh, if, if you ever saw this film, really, this says everything I'm trying to say. I don't know if anyone ever saw a film called Arlington Road. If not, consider yourself blessed. Arlington Road, in a film history uh, line, is the film that Jeff Bridges made after The Big Lebowski, which was a good film. Um, and it's a, it begins with this perverse reinterpretation of Ruby Ridge, except in this case, it is innocent FBI agents who are killed not Randy Weaver's wife. A former FBI agent then gets mixed up with a absolutely loving, friendly bunch of people um, and goes to their parties, but should recognize that something sinister is happening because they play country music. And obviously, as you can imagine from that, they soon discover uh, that it's a cell of neo-Nazi terrorists. And we end up well, spoilers, uh, never mind, but um, it's not really worth worrying about. Um, but there is, uh, it culminates with the destruction of the FBI headquarters in Washington, exactly as laid out in the famous neo-Nazi manifesto, uh, the Turner Diaries. The advertising for this film is fascinating um, because the whole point of it is that your neighbors are likely to be um, evil Nazi terrorists. It, it takes you way back to those Cold War films which told you that your neighbors were communists. Well, of course, we've learned a lot then. We're much less paranoid, so now we know they're neo-Nazis. And the tagline of the film's publicity is, I do not make this up, your paranoia is real. That's on the poster, as, as the phrase goes, I don't make this up. And you may say, well, you know, films are films, TV is TV, uh, what does it matter? I'll tell you why it matters. Because it creates a social ideology of terrorism and what terrorism is. That decides how people report the news, it decides how government agencies respond to threats, and it decides what rewards they give for threats. If you want to understand the absolutely bizarre response in 2000 and 2001 of federal agencies to charges that Islamic fanatics were coming to the United States, signing up in flight schools and learning to fly airliners but not wanting to land, I'll tell you exactly why. Because in those years, all informed people knew that Middle Eastern terrorism was overblown, not serious, and a simple law enforcement issue. If you want to deal with someone serious, go out and get me some neo-Nazis. By the way, I'm not trying to trivialize the neo-Nazis. They are the only group in this country who've ever seriously got access to bubonic plague. These are, danger these are dangerous people. But taking them seriously does not mean that we should ignore everyone else. Uh, you, you may remember in 1998, uh, there were some appalling terrorist attacks 
uh, by Islamist fanatics around the world, in East Africa, for example, against American targets. Hundreds died. In 2000, uh, they uh, came close to sinking an American uh, warship. They killed many, uh, many Americans. And the American response to these incidents is completely underpowered. And the reason is the media are not prepared to accept that this is a real danger when they know that the real danger is in the heartland. They know it's an outgrowth of Oklahoma City and of Waco. And that, in large measure, is, is why we get the road to 9-11. Because the agencies that should have been fighting terrorism are fighting the wrong sort of terrorism. They've come to uh, believe that. You know, uh, if you ever want to understand, um, let's say, the American response in this era, there is a film you might look at called Wag the Dog. The story of Wag the Dog is this. It's about a, an American president facing a terminal sexual scandal, and the only way he can escape from it um, is by faking an international crisis in a bogus country and he gets the media to invent a, an artificial crisis. In 1998, when there were very, very genuine um, terrorist attacks against American uh, targets around the world, uh, the White House spokesman told some media people um, of steps they were taking to attack Qaeda targets in Afghanistan, and the first question from the media was, have you seen the movie? And the movie they were referring to was Wag the Dog. If anyone ever tells you that film and popular culture do not shape the real world behavior of agencies, please bear uh, that in mind. It's very hard to remember. Um, it's, it seems that the events we are, are talking about here are so recent, but they are so long ago in terms of most of the people who are out on the, uh, the campus there. If I can just uh, truly frighten you, the uh, freshmen who will be coming uh, onto this campus uh, this coming fall uh, were born, oh, around about the time of Oklahoma City. They were born in 1995. Uh, clearly, uh, what they know about Waco is, uh, the Waco disaster is minimal. Um, but what they might know is a film called uh, Red State. And if you've never heard of Red State, I, I will tell you about this. And it's, it's, uh, it's a depressing story. Red State is by uh, Kevin Smith, who is a director who made things like uh, Clerks and uh, Mulrats and uh, other slacker movies. And what impresses is that it is completely an equal opportunity offender, but it is, is his Waco film. It is about a small religious cult which has a setting like Waco, except it's much more like the Westboro Baptist Church. It is a fanatical anti-gay church, which among other things actually carries out assassinations of homosexuals. It is a murder gang. It is a bloodthirsty, trigger-happy fanatics uh, led by an utterly evil demagogue. And you might think, what could be worse? And then you meet the law enforcement officials who come to attack them, a group called the Arson Task Force, A-T-F, subtlety is not a strong point here, <laughs> which operates under cold-blooded secret orders to exterminate every member of the group, men, women, and children, uh, on the ludicrous grounds that they're terrorists. It's a Waco movie, but it's also a post-9-11 film because as uh, one of the ATF bureaucrats explains in this film, as a result of 9-11, they now have the power to label any act of religious violence as terrorism and to kill the offenders or imprison them for life. And you may think, why does that matter? And the short story is any of our students out there, if they've ever seen a film or read a book about Waco, it's that one. This should give us pause. This should uh, alarm us. So just to uh, pull this uh, uh, together, what I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting is that the Waco 
and I entirely agree with uh, uh, Stuart Wright here, is so important because it does shape so much of modern politics. It comes to be the first battle and an enduring battle in the culture wars. It also becomes um, almost a declaration of war between red and blue states. And that term would not be invented for a few years yet, but the uh, concept is so obvious that, you know, go, uh, go back to guns, there are two views about uh, Waco. There are those people who say, why on earth did they, uh, did they have all those guns? And then the view of large parts of the rest of the country, which is, well, obviously, they've got an inventory, arsenal, inventory. You must have a lot of guns. You have a lot of guns, you must be a terrorist, versus you have a lot of guns, lucky you, uh, the kind of red and blue state uh, approach. As it's a, in domestic politics, it shapes a lot of modern ideas. But oddly, however bizarre this may sound, its long-running effect would be in foreign policy, and oddly again, in disarming an American response to real and dangerous terrorism. Um, and you will see these issues in the next few days. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm a college professor. That means a couple of things. It means I, I'm allowed to give people assignments, okay? Here is, your, here is your assignment. In the next few days, I very, very much hope that they will be announcing an arrest of a perpetrator in the Boston bombings. When that happens, please observe the politicized quality of the response. I think I know what cause promoted those bombs. I do not know for sure. But I do know that already we are seeing people stake out ground saying the person must be from this cause and therefore it relates to this issue. Slate Magazine, for example, has been pleading and I would say praying were it not the source, praying that the perpetrator turns out to be a white Christian man. There are other people who have the exact opposite view. But if you want to see the politics of terrorism, we're going to see them in the next few days. Look, please understand, the most important thing is to catch and stop the person responsible. Everyone here agrees on that. But be aware, if you want to see political spin, you're going to see it in the next few days. I've suggested that Waco's impact extended to national global politics, did a lot to shape American attitudes during the Clinton years. Looking at those widespread effects, it's easy to forget the simple situation at the heart of the affair, and that those mighty issues were so irrelevant to the ordinary people, the humble people, the ordinary souls who traveled to Mount Carmel seeking simple biblical truth concerning the end times. The fires of Waco mattered so much because they burnt at a critical turning point in American politics and in its cultural debates. And I will wind up there. Thank you very much. to ask a question of Philip Jenkins. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I think the gentleman you got the mic. Thank you very much, sorry. Dr. Jenkins, for your uh, unbiased and uh, uh, very helpful look at the problems that we have in our society in the United States of the culture as it's been unraveling from what so many of us grew up with as having the uh, American pride in the melting pot in our country as being the best country on earth. And can you give us, in your opinion, the uh, attitude that would be the other side of the coin that we can ref respond to the constant barrage we hear of, for example, we only have a 13% approval rating of Congress today in our country. All of the things that are so depressing around us constantly. I want to be the uh, encourager 
that this is still a country with a great future? You know, I, I, I never know what to make of some of those opinion polls. I mean, I always enjoyed the one in Canada in the, um, in the 1990s where was the show that the number of can Canadians who thought that the then Prime Minister was doing a good job was half the number who thought that Elvis was still alive. Um, you know, I sometimes think we pay too much attention to government for this reason. If there's a country in the world that works astonishingly, it's the United States. I mean, I've now lived long enough to see any number of successive waves of X fill in the country is going to take over and surpass the United States within a decade. You know, does anyone remember it was going to be Japan's century? Does anyone remember it was uh, going, to, uh, going to be um, Europe's? You know, Europe, the great military power, uh, 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 until they're, they're bailed out by the, uh, uh, the US um, again, and then it's going to be China's, well, yeah, maybe. Um, I've, I've always said that this is a great country where everything works except the government. Um, but you look at the degree of um, enterprise, economic growth. I've got a challenge for you. Do a little chart. Five-year periods, 1965, 1970, 1975, whatever, up to the present. And in each of those, pen in the danger that is going to wipe out the United States in the next 25 to 30 years. And look back at them and laugh. Okay? Do you remember how we were going to um, run out of um, oil before the year uh, 2000? Hello, we live in a society we're going to be producing more than Saudi Arabia very soon. Uh, we're going to fall apart in um, race wars. Uh, the, the, the Russians are, are going to trash us militarily. You know, Russia, the country that couldn't organize a decent-sized food fight. Uh, this, this is absurd. Every one of these prophecies of doom has failed. So uh, if you want encouragement, um, I, um, I think that's it. If you, if you look at the uh, Congress, yeah, sure, despair. But if you look at uh, uh, the country, it's uh, much, much greater than that. Um, look, look at the enemies we've outlived. Yeah, and uh, th th that for me is is um, is the word of uh, is the word of encouragement. Um. Gentlemen here. The question resolve, uh, revolves around uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or yep. drones. Yep. Uh, I just read recently that they, uh, there's a forecast or maybe as many as 20,000 drones in the air in the United States in the next five or six years, uh, various police forces and so forth. And the second part of my question is, uh, it apparently is okay for the United States to assassinate a person outside the United States, including American citizens, at what point is it okay to do it inside the United States? Yeah. Well, um, neither of those, of course, uh, really stem from uh, uh, my talk, so I, I sort of step back to uh, previous, uh, previous things I've, um, I, I've written. Um, I don't have particular concerns with uh, drone uh, warfare in areas of uh, battle or insurgency. In fact, if you ever want to see the best argument for um, drones in warfare, look at the correspondence that turned up from bin Laden, um, where he's dealing with these uh, panicked mem uh, memos from his subordinates saying, we can't get anyone to fill the ranks because they know they'll be assassinated within a couple of days of taking over. And I'm, you know, I'm so filled with sympathy for the situation. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a totally different situation in the U.S. But uh, I, I honestly don't know enough about the uh, uh, about the situation. Um, for me, there's a whopping difference between uh, carrying out violence in a war zone, uh, which Afghanistan is, and uh, countries like Somalia and Yemen are, um, and within the uh, United States or within the boundaries of, uh, of friendly territories. But I'm, as I said, I'm, um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just uh, speaking off the uh, top of my head there. Some things would trouble me far more than, um, uh, uh, than others. There is also the issue when, say, an American citizen uh, like uh, was, uh, a lackey was um, assassinated overseas. You know, the, 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 there really are no plausible other means of, um, of, of bringing them in. 
uh, one of the problems that the Clinton administration had in the late 90s was they had a criminal justice model and what that meant was it was impossible for agencies to share intelligence lest it ruin a prosecution. Um, so once again, that was one reason why we had the mess that led to 9-11. Uh, I'm not terribly worried about assassinations in war zones. I would be extremely worried about any comparable acts on US soil. So that would be a kind of a quick, uh, uh, a quick response, which would probably managed to alienate everyone, but hey. Uh, sorry, Jen, yes. Uh, what do you think about the prospects of a new constitutional convention and what about its aftermath? I think the prospects for a new constitutional convention are pretty close to zero. Um, I, I, re realistically, uh, I, uh, you, you know, the, the, the whole constitutional revision issue, the uh, Founding Fathers meant it, uh, meant it to be hard. Um, it, it is, and uh, I, but you know, it, 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 it is an interesting question. If you were to look at the kind of subjects that we've looked at today, and these very you know, wide-ranging, interesting range of papers, discussions, I mean, we've looked at various um, government uh, atrocities and misbehavior. How would you change a constitution? How would you change a state law to prevent those? Isn't it instead a case of enforcing the laws that you actually have? You know? Um, so, uh, you know, the uh, Lenin's, uh, sorry, Stalin's constitution of the 1930s was one of the most magnificent texts of human freedom. Guess what? They ignored every clause of it. So I, I just want them to enforce the laws they have, not pass new ones. In fact, I'd love to see a situation where anybody who passes a new law simultaneously has to repeal an old one just to keep it the, the number of the same. But that's, that's by the way. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jenkins, thank you for what you've shared with us in your presentation. Uh, my name's Ed Cook. I've got a PhD in Church and State Studies here from Baylor. Uh, and I'm also an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. So my question uh, relating specifically to your topic, uh, in the research that you did in the field of politics and popular culture relating to the Waco tragedy in the last 20 years, uh, did you run across anything where it uh, talked about the views of the Branch Davidians with respect to other religious groups? As far as like posing any kind of a potential threat or part of their eschatology, their prophetic views uh, relating to that? You know, the main impression um, I have, and I think there are several other people here who work very extensively on this, is the uh, astonishing uh, ignorance of the, the details of the, uh, of the theology. Uh, so if you're looking at you know, what the federal agencies uh, m made of it originally, I mean, there's, there's a lovely line I always enjoy from the, uh, one of the documentaries where they're, they're discussing the great debate. There'd been some question uh, with Koresh, are we dealing with a delusional personality or are we dealing with a con man? Well, that seems to exhaust all the alternatives right there, doesn't it? Um, and qu quite seriously, I mean, that, that's the level of debate. There is no concern with, um, uh, with the details of theology. There's one very dangerous, deeply dangerous uh, consequence there, which is the idea that once you have classified a group as apocalyptic, as a doomsday cult, it is fair game. But what that means is a group that believes in doomsday must therefore be trying to promote doomsday, which is nonsense. Uh, you know, I, I always point out the, uh, the oldest Christian prayer, uh, the oldest Christian liturgy is something called the Didache from around the year 100. And it's a communion service and it ends with the great Christian prayer, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus come and may the present world pass away, okay? Christianity is a doomsday cult. Um, and that, that idea, uh, I, the, the idea of the doomsday cult, the suicide cult, these are not just wildly inaccurate ideas, they're dangerous ideas, because when you label a group like that, they're open, you've declared open season. And so, um, and you, you, you may think I'm speaking to your question at a very 
unsophisticated level, deliberately so, because that's how it's reported. That's how it's understood in popular culture. Yeah, I certainly would, uh, would agree with you regarding an assessment like that. I don't think that uh, any religious group in America would want to be improperly labeled or identified in such a way as to become basically uh, open season on them. Uh, I guess the, the kind of the deeper issue I'm getting at is that uh, from the perspective of a church state scholar, to what extent should government be involved in the monitoring of a religious group that has the potential to harm other religious groups sure. based on their, their ideology, their worldview? And the reason I, I simply bring this up as a, as a question for discussion is that, as I mentioned, uh, for 20 years I've worked as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. I'm ordained in the church. And it was back in uh, shortly before 2001 that in one of our large churches in, in Dallas that there were secret service agents that were there in the worship service on Sabbath morning because they had detected chatter among the Davidians regarding the fulfillment of Ezekiel 9 where it talks about uh, six men with weapons of destruction. The Lord commands them to go in yeah. and slay all of those that don't have the mark and so forth. So they actually had uh, Secret Service agents there protecting our congregation uh, due to the chatter that they had picked up. So, yeah. and, and you know, I, I have uh, unfortunately or fortunately, however one would look at it, uh, I have had to had interaction and dealings with Branch Davidians that have tried to infiltrate our churches. Um, you know, I, I work here with two local Adventist congregations, and I, I know from experience the last six years that we've had uh, cases of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's more along the lines of what I, was, I no, guess I was driving at. Absolutely. You know, I, um, I, I see what you're saying. And uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, where this was most pressing was in the uh, um, abortion clinic uh, issue. When there was anti-abortion uh, terrorism that was being organized by groups that were connected with some religious congregations. You had the Army of God, which was quite an active uh, yeah, terrorist movement. And the uh, Justice Department had the deadly problem of how far to um, infiltrate or place informers in, uh, in religious congregations, clearly that's an issue they've now got with, um, w w with uh, Muslim congregations. Um, and, you know, it, it's, um, it's deadly dangerous. And uh, as, as you rightly say it, as you frame your question, um, it's a very tight balance. There is a pressing uh, need, uh, if, you, if you like, for, to promote public safety. But, you know, there are actually good um, principles that would guide this. And okay, you know church and state. You know that the Supreme Court has passed uh, certain decisions which sound like a wonderful recipe. There's sherbet and there's lemon. And what the, those cases do, I'm not kidding. They're named after the plaintiffs in the cases, sherbet and verney and uh, lemon and Kurtzman. And what those cases do is they regulate what a government should do in passing laws. And there are certain things like, first of all, you mustn't uh, uh, discriminate, you mustn't favor one religion over another. What you must do must neither hinder uh, nor promote the exercise of religion. There's a series of very well-known rules in those cases. And actually, if you apply those to law enforcement, um, a law enforcement role in dealing with religion, they work very well. So I, I would suggest that we have a number of legal principles which do lay down that neutrality. And I'm delighted to say that the courts tend to be extremely vigilant um, in those. You see it now in terms of um, lawsuits against Catholic um, uh, dioceses in clergy abuse, uh, where the degree of uh, penetration of those uh, uh, institutions to get uh, uh, documents w would seem to be highly, highly intrusive, but there's felt to be a greater social goal. So it's very delicate, and uh, you, know, you, you, you raise a very sensitive question. Shall we take one more question, or should we finish there? We're done. Um, in, in the words of Professor Melton, we're done. Thank you. <laughs>